Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to conservation and careful management of the state's forests to make them more resilient and better habitats for wildlife. Choosewood.com. From St. Louis Public Radio. This is St. Louis on the Air. There certainly is a law in Missouri that you cannot pay a public servant. You can't walk up to a member of the forestry division in Forest Park and say, you know, $500 to remove that tree so I can improve my view. You can't, you know, as we've learned, you can't pay aldermen for special favors, um, you know, in, in the Board of Aldermen. When you did try to figure this out, is this unusual? What were the responses you got? Yeah, unheard of. I've never heard of this before. This is very troublesome. This is this is highly unethical. Um, this really violates the 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 ethical foundation of policing. Um, in that the it's a public good that is supposed to be distributed according to need. I'm Danny Wisentowski. St. Louis has a police problem. In some of the wealthiest neighborhoods, sworn officers with the Metropolitan Police Department, in uniform, riding in SUVs marked police, are being offered bonuses for investigating crimes and arresting criminals. But the offers aren't coming from the taxpayer-funded police department. They're coming from a private security company called the city's finest. That's just one of the details uncovered in an investigation published this week in ProPublica by St. Louis-based reporter Jeremy Kohler. And Jeremy is here with us today. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Danny. Jeremy, to start off, give us the basics here. What is the city's finest, and what is its relationship to the St. Louis Metropolitan Police Department? The city's finest is the largest uh, of a number of companies in in town that uh, hire off-duty St. Louis police officers, um, and then uh, are then hired by taxing districts around the city, where those officers then work for the company in those in those uh, neighborhoods. Um, primarily, uh, the biggest neighborhoods are downtown, the Central West End, and Soulard. And, you know, you mentioned a, a couple locations of where these uh, forces are. What what do neighborhoods have to do to reach this point to actually bring those uh, police forces in? Uh, there, there are at least 15 uh, areas of the city that have created taxing districts, either special business districts or community improvement districts that raise money either through property taxes or sales taxes. And they pull the money. Um, they don't use all of the money on security usually. They, they Some use it for lighting. Some use it for surveillance cameras. Um, but but many of them use a good portion of it on private policing. And, and Jeremy, you write that the result of these private police forces is this two unequal levels of policing for St. Louis residents and businesses. And you note that these affluent neighborhoods, you know, which are raising these millions of dollars through their taxing districts to pay for these police, they're generally less affected by violent crime than some other parts of the city. What do we know about how this affects how, you know, neighborhoods that are facing, you know, real critical levels of violent crime are resources being pulled away from them so these cops can walk patrols in the central west end and downtown? Well, we've been hearing for years from uh, aldermen on the north side just about uh, a lack of police presence in their neighborhoods. And it, you've, you've even heard it from the police department. Uh, ch- uh, former Chief John Hayden testified in, in, to the, the uh, Board of Aldermen in 2020 that the police does not prioritize violent crime. So the second district, which had seven murders in 2020, has the same basic number of police officers that the 6th District has, which had uh, 76 murders in 2020. Um, And so with each of the police districts receiving about the same level of policing, areas that can afford it have tried to uh, supplement that with private policing and hiring police officers through these companies. You know, Jeremy, one of you know the findings in your story, both you know describing just the existence of these private police forces and and the way that they're deployed, but also these email records that you obtained from the owner uh, of the city's finest. Was, this company was founded by a retired St. Louis police detective named Rob Betts, and this email was sent to off-duty St. Louis cops on his payroll, and they show him offering a cash reward, a, a bounty, essentially. 
for catching specific criminals. And, and you write in this piece, public servants, including police officers, are generally prohibited from accepting gratuities or rewards. It is a felony in Missouri to offer a benefit to a public servant for any specific action that they take in that role. And you also mention that the St. Louis Police Manual says offers cannot accept gratuities, rewards, or compensation unless they are for work outside the department. And that last line is, you know, is kind of curious, but what do we know about the legality of, you know, to offer payments to police officers for solving specific crimes? It seems a little untoward. I, I think, you know, I... I, I... I think it would have to be decided in court. I don't know if it's legal or not. There certainly is a law in Missouri that you cannot pay a public servant. You can't walk up to a member of the forestry division in Forest Park and say, you know, $500 to remove that tree so I can improve my view. You can't, you know, as we've learned, you can't pay aldermen for special favors, um, you know, in, in the Board of Aldermen. Um, so wh whether that extends to what police officers do off duty. Uh, is is a question I don't know the answer to. And, and you you did ask this question to, to several you know policing experts from other cities, and their responses I think they described it as wild was one of the words they you know when you did try to figure this out is this unusual? What were the responses you got? Yeah, unheard of. I've never heard of this before. This is very troublesome. This is this is highly unethical. Um, this really violates the 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 ethical foundation of policing um, in that. The, it's a public good that is supposed to be distributed according to need. Now, we're, we're talking about uh, you know, a new investigation from reporter Jeremy Kohler uh, in ProPublica. And you know, it gets to, I think, the larger issue of police staffing in the region is, is that this has been a crisis level for a while. And you have multiple departments, multiple you know, counties trying to solve it in their own way, increasing pay, waiving residency requirements. Um, and there is something of a bidding war. This private police force, the, the existence of this in this market, is it a response to that lack of police staffing, that tension, or are they capitalizing on it? You know, it's probably both. Uh, th this started in the 90s uh, when there were well over, you know, 1,500 officers in, in the city, and there was a perception even then that there wasn't enough. So I'm not sure what the, the number would be where the city would say that, you know, areas of the city would say, well, we have enough police officers. Um, so... Um, you know, I think the lack of policing in certain cities is felt a lot more acutely than in others, and um, and I think those are, those are the areas that are really suffering. Now, now in your uh, article, um, you did reach out to the city, to Mayor Tashara Jones, to Public Safety Director Dan Isom. They did not respond for your article. Um, I did reach out because I was curious. I wanted to know, uh, you know, just some more details, and especially because you did hear uh, from Heather Taylor, who is the Public Safety Deputy Director, who said there's a planned complete review of how off-duty officers are used. Now, when I got a response from them by email this morning, they had, had this curious response about the status of that review and, and what exactly it's looking at. The response went, at this time, the city is focused on labor negotiations with labor groups. The Public Safety Division has been engaging in ongoing discussions regarding secondary policies. What do you hear in that response? Could you know, these labor negotiations, which I, I assume is a reference to you know, the contract negotiations with the various police unions, you know, could that spell a change for how off-duty officers are allowed to work for companies like the city's finest? Yeah, I think that this is being misframed as an answer to the questions that I raised in my story. Uh, the, the there are labor negotiations that will go take place, um, you know, to possibly provide raises to St. Louis police officers, um, and you know, they're they're still after the trainees come through the academy. The department will have, I think, just under eleven hundred officers. Uh, still, you know, about a, about 100 officers under the level where the the mayor uh, cut the the police force back to last year. Um, you know, if, if if you improve the pay for them, I'm not sure that 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 officers are going to stop working secondary or that the taxing districts will not be able to hire them. I, I think if you pay the officers more, the the uh, the private companies will pay more than that. And you know, the, I, I just don't see this as being a response to the the issues that I raised. You know, there is, you know, this sort of underlying context to our you know, discussion over policing, and, and I, you, you get at it in your article, which is that when people call 911 in the city, a lot of times they're put on hold, or they don't see the policing resources they wish they could see, the patrols, the, you know, the community policing, and a lot of this has to do with staffing, with money, with the way that the department is, is structured, and 
when I when I was reading it, it was really striking to see the remark that Rob Betts, the owner of the city's finest, made in 2019, where he said in a statement to KSDK, he considers his company an extension of the police department. And he's discussed making sort of his own 911 system. Now, when I did uh, ask for comment from the city uh, this morning, they did reply, no, they don't agree that this, that this company is an extension of the police department. They all are working on improving the 911 system. But is is there a space for this? Is this, you know, by whether you call it one way or the other, it does seem like these services are acting as an extension with their official uniforms of the police department. How do we get in this gray area? Very quickly, if you can. Very quickly, this company came out of the police department. It was started by a police officer. It, it, it employs one out of every five St. Louis police officers. Uh, almost half of the senior command staff works for it. Um, so, um, so that's how we got here. And, um, you know, going forward, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not really sure exactly how they, how they stop doing that or how, what they do differently. I think we'll just have to see. Some really serious questions raised by Jeremy Kohler, St. Louis based reporter for ProPublica. And you can read his piece on our website, stlpublicradio.org. It's titled St. Louis Private Police Forces Make Security a Luxury of the Rich. This episode was produced by Danny Wissentowski. Audio engineering and podcast design by Aaron Dorr. Our production intern is Avery Rogers. Our executive producer is Alex Hoyer. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio. Understanding starts here. Our podcast proudly supports St. Louis artists by using music from Life Creative Group. Do you find yourself regularly listening to episodes of St. Louis on the Air? Suggest us to a friend you think might enjoy our conversations. And leave us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the simplest way to help people discover our show. Thank you. St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Support comes from Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to sustainable and sound conservation of the state's forests, which support more than 41,000 Missouri jobs, resulting in a $10 billion industry. Choosewood.com.